lines look very familiar. I'll wait you a few minutes until everybody on the left hand side says they're joining. Once everybody goes clear or has joined, uh, Mr. Shantz, if you could mute everyone but us, fantastic. All right, folks, we will get started. The hour is 732. The school committee is returning back from executive session this evening with nothing to report. Uh, if you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm sure people will be continuing to join throughout the meeting, so we're just going to roll, and as people join, um, I would ask that you remain on mute. Um, until public comment when we will allow folks to uh, comment on anything that is on the agenda this evening. Um, I'll start with introduction to the school committee. To my far right is Mrs. Holbrook, followed by Mr. Collins, Mr. Gelfi, Superintendent Swenson. Um, I'm Mike Dolan, the chair of the school committee, Ms. King, Dr. Prewindowski, Mr. Marrera, and also in the room we have our executive secretary, Ms. McDougall, and Mr. Schantz, our IT director, who is running technology. Also on the phone, we have Mr. Hammond, who is a member of the school committee, and several different administrators who will be presenting uh, reports this evening. So, um, first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from September 9th, 2020. I'll entertain a motion for approval. So moved. We have a motion by Mr. Murray. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Fulmer. Do we have any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, Mr. Florence. Aye. Mr. Gelby. Aye. Mr. Hammond. Aye. Mrs. Holbrook. Aye. Mr. King. Aye. Mr. Marrera. Aye. Dr. Krewdowski. Aye. Chair votes aye. We have our minutes approved. Thank you all. Next on the agenda, we have educational reports with an academic reopening report from Mr. Powers and Ms. Richards. Thank you, Mr. Dolan, Mr. Swenson, members of the school committee. Um, I am proud to report uh, about our reopening of school thus far. I can't believe it's uh, almost October. Uh, it, it seems as though uh, school started so long ago, but yet it really uh, only started a few days ago for our students. So it, it, it's been great. Uh, if, if you've been in the schools, if you've had an opportunity to talk to the students, uh, which is obviously, um, you know, really what we, we gauge our success by is the students are very, very excited to be back in the buildings. You can see it uh, when you talk to them, you can hear it. It is just phenomenal to have them back. Uh, and obviously, as you know, we've shared uh, several times already this fall uh, through different communications you know, all the time and effort that went into planning, we knew our plan and our reopening would only be as successful as those implementing it. And really, I, I can't say enough about our teaching staff, uh, the time and effort they have put in since the students have been back. Uh, they uh, obviously, as they always do, they always put the students first. Uh, this is certainly such a unique time uh, to be in education, whether you're a teacher, an administrator, uh, a student, a, a parent, uh, I know everyone's trying to juggle all of those responsibilities. Uh, but I, I just, you know, Mr. Dolan, members of the school committee, I, I just can't recognize our teaching staff enough. Uh, it is 
like I said, uh, you, you know, uncharted territories for them, uh, but they are taking this challenge head on and we are just so proud of them. Uh, but more importantly, again, as I stated, the reopening of school operationally has gone very, very well. Um, as you know, uh, we set up all of our buildings using uh, the DESE recommended uh, mitigation strategies. We have fall reopening plans for the district. Each one, uh, each individual building has their own reopening plan. And all of those were put in place by our building admin and, and obviously our teaching staff, our custodial staff, and, and really our ESPs and, and any staff member that's part of the BR community. And, and as I stated, our operational opening has gone very, very smooth. We're very proud of uh, how it has gone. And, and, and again, I just can't highlight enough how great it is to have our, our students back in the building. Uh, as you know, we do have uh, the majority of our students back in what we are calling our hybrid model. That was the um, chosen model by the school committee and the one that Mr. Swenson and I recommended to the school committee. Uh, so we do have the majority of our students coming two days a week. Uh, they are home for three. So they are in-person learning and, and also uh, learning at home or hybrid uh, is part of the hybrid model um, on those off days. Uh, we do have a number of students that, that come, uh, you know, four to five days a week, depending on, uh, you know, their, their level of need. Uh, and those uh, are, make up another cohort of students. And again, uh, it, it's, it, you know, so five days a week, we basically have, uh, a, you know, a student, student population within our buildings. And then we also have students that have chosen to start the school year fully remote. Um, and that looks different at the various levels. And I know Ms. Richards is going to give you um, a, a brief update on that. But our, uh, at the elementary level, K to five, our students that have elected to go fully remote are assigned to a, uh, we're referring to as a, a, a BR at home. That's our remote learning program. So a teacher in a classroom, much like they would be in a person, um, and then our middle school and high school students are using a learning management system uh, in its ingenuity. Uh, it was vetted by the state and recommended as one of the learning management systems that districts could use. Um, and, and so we did implement ingenuity. Uh, and, and we've had relative good success with that. You know, one of the uh, challenges is, is finding a perfect match to what we offer in person uh, versus what Edgenuity offers to those students that have elected to go fully remote. And it's not 100% aligned, um, and, and we knew that going in, uh, but we do feel as though that after looking at the various programs that this program uh, would uh, meet our needs. And, we, you know, obviously, because the, the school year is still so new for, for all of us, uh, you know, we're continuing to, to reevaluate and reassess on a daily basis. We met again as an administrative team today uh, and started to pose some different scenarios that we're now encountering that maybe we, uh, you know, didn't anticipate or that if we did anticipate, you know, certain, you know, to, to various degrees that, you know, we need, maybe need to revisit, get some feedback from our stakeholders, our students, our staff, and, and obviously our families, and then make any changes. Uh, and as you know, we've said from the get-go, this is back in the spring, but certainly again this fall, that this, everything we're doing is, is, is built upon flexibility. And so we, we're not, uh, you know, we're not married to one particular way of doing things. If once we start to implement this plan and we realize that things need to be revised and changed, uh, we will certainly do so. Uh, but again, I, I do, I, I just, I really wanna highlight because at the end of the day, uh, you know, when you talk to the students, when you see the students, it, it really is motivating and it's, it's refreshing. This is why we, you know, spent all those hours, uh, you know, the summer getting ready and why our teachers are working so hard already, even though, you know, we're really only, um, you know, two weeks or so into the school year with students. Um, everyone is just, you know, collectively, um, you, you know, in it to win it. And, and our, our kids are going to benefit from this. Uh, and we want to try to replicate a, as much as a, a normal school day, school year as we can. Uh, we know that's going to be a challenge, but everybody's accepting that challenge head on. Uh, but I know Ms. Richards did want to just, uh, you know, provide a, a little uh, information about our BR at home program and students. Good evening, Mr. Dolan and Mr. Swenson and members of the school committee. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about our BR at Home program, which I'm very proud of so far this year. Um, our kindergarten through fifth grade classrooms, we have 13 classrooms, K through five, and um, they range in size from 22, um, as big as up to 39. We've had a lot of students entering and exiting uh, the program since throughout the summer and then since the beginning of the school year. Um, and I have to say, it has been an absolute pleasure to 
spy a few moments here and there of the remote learning that's going on. And from the parent feedback I have received, the teachers are doing a phenomenal job, far better than I could have imagined all summer long while Mr. Powers and I and Mr. Jovalos and Mr. Swenson were imagining what this might look like. And I even got a parent email after two days saying that the first grade remote learning teacher, it was like she'd been running a remote school her whole career. They just really rose to this challenge immediately and are providing such a wonderful learning experience to our students, even though they're learning from home. Um, our middle school and high school BR at home is supported by a team of teachers. There are teachers handling the more logistic parts of the platform, and then there are teachers providing academic support in the core content areas. We have 192 students in grades six, seven, and eight on Edgenuity, and 141 high school students on Edgenuity. And um, you know, the teachers have been really diligent going through training, kind of flying the plane while building it as um, you know, we signed on to this program rather late in the summer and they have just really gotten things up and running um, really well for our students and are doing nice things to maintain social connections and um, as well. Uh, and we've been fortunate enough to be able to hire some additional staff to help support this program. So overall, I think that, you know, it's it's going really well. And I'm just, I'm thankful for all of our teachers, but I'm especially thankful for our BR at home teachers because they're doing something that's never really been done before. And they've handled it with such grace and they've handled it and they're working so hard. So it's been a wonderful start to the year. Thank you, Ms. Richards. And, and Mr. Dolan, and Mr. Swenson, members of the school committee, just a, you know, other two other uh, points of information for you this evening. Uh, the first is obviously uh, this morning was our first encounter of some challenging weather. And so we, we, you know, we, we do anticipate that as the year goes on, uh, we may run into similar situations, whether it's high wind or rain, or, or certainly even as the winter months come, uh, snow. And along with that may come power outages or the internet may go down. Those are all things that we are aware of. And, and I want parents to know and understand that we, we too may have those uh, challenges as well at the school level. And, and it's okay, we'll, we'll, you know, I don't want anyone to panic that if for some reason they're at home and they can't log in, um, you know, certainly what we uh, are, are going to encourage families to do, and this will be communicated at, by the district and, and by the buildings as we get into, uh, you know, more inclement weather, uh, you know, just to reach out, obviously, if, if the internet's down, you're not gonna be able to email, but the, you know, old school, pick up the phone and, and call your, your child's school just to let them know that, you know, internet is down and you're not able to log in. And vice versa, you know, if, if we have a situation where uh, the schools are impacted, uh, you know, we'll have to communicate that as well to uh, to families. But we're, we're just asking everybody in, in these type of situations, it, you know, if we do have a power outage or Wi-Fi goes down, the internet goes down, uh, that, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's understandable that that may happen and we'll just... Uh, when everybody uh, reconnects, we'll, we'll continue on. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there because I do know there was some, you know, concern this morning, um, you know, for some of our students, uh, even at, uh, you know, my house, my, my two students were having some trouble with, with the internet initially and, and thankfully it was able to come back on. So I, I imagine other families were in that situation as well. But we know in the past uh, we have had buildings where the power flickers or the internet goes down. So we do find ourselves as educators in, in similar situations, but, uh, you know, rest assured, it, it'll be okay. Uh, and lastly, I just wanted to share with you, I, I know we had, uh, you know, promised members of the school committee, members of the community, uh, that we would put out uh, to the public a cohort calendar, uh, just so parents would know exactly which days uh, their students should attend school. Um, so you, you should have a copy of that this evening. I, before I shared it with the community, I did want to just run it by you. Uh, you can see that it is just through uh, the month of December. Uh, again, we felt it better at this point instead of, you know, putting a calendar out for the full year and, and possibly having to go back and, and make revisions, we would just put out one uh, short term uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so it, it does, um, you know, take into account any uh, professional development day, any holiday, uh, but it does really lay out, uh, you know, that cohort A, cohort B and cohort C schedule. Um, the other thing that we did take a look at is uh, the, the numbers of in-person learning days is, is actually very similar. Uh, when, when we actually counted, I, I know earlier in the year when we were looking at the school calendar and we were talking about, you know, uh, beginning of the week holidays versus end of the week holidays, when we actually counted up the in-person days, not necessarily, you know, factoring in the holidays, but, you know, either I'm in person Monday or Tuesday or Thursday or Friday, uh, there was only a, a difference of a day. 
And so initially we thought that, you know, potentially the week of uh, Thanksgiving and the week of Christmas vacation, they're, they're both short weeks. Um, it, we actually have a, a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, a half day Wednesday. So we contemplated, uh, you know, do we look at possibly bringing in cohort B for an in-person, but we really felt as though one, it would, you know, swing the numbers the other way uh, in cohort B's favor which is fine, uh, you know, we, we can certainly do that. But just for consistency sake, I, I think for, for parents, you, you know, although it would be well enough in advance, we just felt like if parents can finally wrap their head around, okay, I'm A, cohort A, I'm coming Monday, Tuesday, and now all of a sudden we start, you know, making some changes uh, on certain weeks, uh, you know, and, and if for some reason, uh, you know, it, it slips by them, it could create some confusion. So we just felt, you know, throughout the school year, we will keep it uh, cohort A coming Monday, Tuesday. And if there's a holiday or a day off, so be it. And then same thing with cohort B, at least for now and in, in, in through uh, December. And then we will reevaluate. We'll continue to update this cohort calendar as the year goes on uh, and certainly, you know, continue to provide uh, months out at a time just so parents have a, a good understanding of, of what's coming up. Um, and then the other piece of information I did share with you, again, more informational um, because it's, it's not, not altering the school calendar, uh, but it is just sharing out the calendar of important dates. Uh, as I stated in the beginning, uh, when we did make changes to the calendar, we would have to revisit, um, you know, things such as uh, tri how many days are in a trimester, uh, when the midpoint would be, and then certainly for our high school students, uh, how many days are going to be in a quarter when those midpoints would be, we had to recalculate all that. So you do have that information in front of you. Um, the other thing that obviously, as you know, we did a, a school-wide virtual open house or district-wide, I'm sorry, um, virtual open house on the 23rd. So that's reflective on that calendar. And then one change that we're going to make uh, this year is um, uh, for parent-teacher conferences, we altered those dates. So any parent that maybe had seen uh, the original calendar from last year, those dates are changed uh, and they will be shared out as soon as, you know, after this evening is, is over, we'll get that information out there. Uh, but we're going to take advantage of uh, election day. As you know, it's a, um, a professional day for our teachers, uh, no school for our students, uh, but because we are going to be recommending that we um, conduct all of our parent-teacher conferences virtually and not in person, we did realize that our teachers would need uh, additional time for that. You know, currently uh, K to eight, they have two evening conferences plus a um, half day. We really wanted to be able to give them a full day plus those two evenings to accomplish uh, parent teacher conferences. And it also, it, it does afford our high school staff some additional time as well. Our high school staff, um, they unfortunately, the, the way the, the calendar goes, they only uh, typically have an evening parent teacher conference, but now they will have a full day as well, plus their evening. So they'll have additional time. So it, it's going to really going to be beneficial for our teachers, uh, but also for our families as well. But that information will be coming out uh, on the calendar of important dates. And then we will revisit other uh, times of the year, you know, such as spring conferences. I'm not 100% sure what that will look like or when those will occur right now. Uh, we, we'd like to try to be able to replicate maybe what we do in the fall, uh, giving a full day again, dedicating that. But we obviously want to see how this fall goes before we make any decisions about the spring. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, as the school year goes on, certainly, um, you, you know, re reserving the opportunity to come back before you and present any other changes to the calendar uh, as, as, you know, possibly new information comes to you. Uh, we will certainly try to keep everybody up to date well in advance. So that way, if any changes do occur, uh, parents, school committee members, administration, faculty, staff, and, and our students obviously are well aware of those changes. Uh, but that's, uh, that's our educational information that we wanted to share with you this evening and happy to answer any questions uh, if you have any. Thank you, Mr. Crouch, Mr. Swan. Uh, just to echo what Mr. Powers and Mrs. Richard said, um, we've had a, a pretty smooth opening uh, for the most part, um, much smoother than I think we anticipated. I realized that, again, as they have stated, um, this is new to everybody. I want to give kudos to our teachers. We know that they are working incredibly hard. They are doing things that are well outside of um, you know, their, their norm, um, and they're taking it, as Mr. Powers said, head on. The remote teachers, I can't say enough uh, about those individuals as well. And I, and I just want to give kudos to Mr. Powers and to uh, Mrs. Richards and Mr. Joe Wells for everything that they've done to kind of put this plan together um, uh, for the school year. And Mrs. Richards, I will say, is on the front lines every day with the remote learning teachers, meeting with them, providing them support. Um, I know that this is somewhat of a bear for her to take on. 
Uh, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot more students than we anticipated that have gone remote. And there's been a lot of interchanging parts as uh, the process has gone. So I can't say enough about those three individuals that the job that they have done um, in order to ensure a smooth opening. As we've stated in the past, you know, there are going to be bumps in the road. There are going to be things, this is new to all of us, and we're going to learn the most from the mistakes that we make. And we are, you know, realizing that there are a few things that we have to tweak here and there. Um, but in the end, I feel like um, we're going to be stronger as a district moving forward, you know, even post COVID. So uh, kudos to everybody uh, who's involved, administrative staff, teachers, paraprofessionals, everyone at the building level from a support staff perspective, our proctors, our custodians, our secretaries, everyone plays a role in um, the product that we're putting out this year. So kudos to all of you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee for Mr. Powers and Ms. Richards or Mr. Hanson? So I have a question first, uh, a quick comment. My question first, and Mr. Powers had brought up a key word of snow days. Um, with the remote learning and the cohorts going so well, is there a possibility of a snow day turning into a remote day and not having any snow days on the back end of the school calendar? I think that, that's, that's, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Swenson, if you. Well, that's good. I think that's the plan. I think that's what, you know, right now, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is kind of leaning in that direction. I feel as though, you know, by time, you know, snow rolls around, um, we'll really, you know, have had a couple of months, hopefully, under our belt before the first real snow. And I can't see why we wouldn't go to a fully remote day on those days um, uh, to, to provide our instruction. Now, similar to what happened today, there might be issues where during a snowstorm, we have to take into consideration you know, situations with internet connectivity or electricity and those things. And again, as Mr. Power said, we don't want parents to panic in those situations. We realize that, that, that those things are gonna happen. Um, but I guess, you know, what I would say, Mr. Ferrer, is I think that's kind of what we would be envisioning, what our new uh, snow day norms would be. Would be more yeah, of a remote day. Normal next year, the year after. Yeah. And I well, the reason I bring this up, because we did talk at one time about blizzard bags. Correct. Right. This is the new blizzard bag. This, uh, this forced our hand into the blizzard bag. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, um, but again, on those case by cases where there might be power out of this, by that morning of calling school, you may already know that, the towns of Graham and Bridgewater are eight percent in the dark. Sure. Well, that would be all right. This is a real snow day because we know you don't have power. Sure. Um, so, but, uh, but to Mr. Kelpie's, you know, point too, I think even post COVID, I mean, I think if you know we have um, done a great job of trying to get technology into the hands of our students, we allow them to kind of hold on to these devices, and um, you know, we now have the training that we have put our teachers through, and they're going to have a whole year of kind of dealing with the remote piece. Um, I, I can't see why in the future we wouldn't go if there were going to be a snow day and become a remote day and that doesn't impact um, our end of the year calendar. So, uh, and now the, the comment I had was, I know we talked about the windstorm this morning, but I also did get a call yesterday from children at home on the random side of a um, lost power at 9 a.m. in the morning and they're trying to log in remote. It was due to a car accident out on Broadway at 138 that took out a telephone pole. Um, but just for informational, and this is something that, you know, I thought I would have thought of, but I did and I have to give credit to a parent uh, that threw it on my Facebook, is older students, uh, maybe at the high school level, um, RMS, BMS, most of the kids have phones and most phones can be turned into a hotspot. So they can actually put their hotspot on and log into their classes. I, I actually told my uh, older kids to email their teachers from their phone just to give them a heads up why they weren't in class. So just sometimes thinking outside the box, uh, just because the power went off, you might have another means to get onto the internet. If, you know, it could be a tablet that's already on cell data, then you can just log in directly or you can turn something into a hotspot. So, uh, you know, and also communicating to their teachers is also a plus too. So just, you know, all parents just need to be aware. Sometimes the simplest answer kind of is right over our head and we don't even realize it. Um, so we just gotta think outside the box a little bit. Uh, Mr. Powers, um, you mentioned the term based on the new um, calendar that will come out. Um, are we back to normal grades now? Power School is up and running with grades as close to the spring? Uh, yes. So as we did uh, put out as part of our plan, 
um, all students uh, would be receiving their traditional grade. So at the elementary level, it'll be a standards-based grade. And at the middle school and high school level, they will be receiving a letter grade. I do know uh, this past week, uh, end of last week, there was um, a, a minor glitch with PowerSchool where I believe uh, students were seeing maybe possibly both a letter grade um, or a number grade would come out, but also see credit, no credit. That has been resolved um, uh, as best we know. So we shouldn't have any additional problems with that, but certainly we would encourage if a parent logs in to their uh, unified classroom page and notices it still says credit, no credit, to certainly reach out to you know their, their teacher, their administrator, uh, or, or even at central office and we can make that change on, on our end. But we were made aware of that and uh, confident to say it's, it's been addressed as, as best we know. Anything else? Yeah, I, I wanted to compliment the grade six team on their uh, video. I watched it the other day. Are showing tonight? Just great job. Yeah. Mr. Uh, <laughs> one other question. If there are Mr. Powers or Mrs. Richards, if there's parents out there that are still kind of struggling with the remote piece of how to navigate their classes if they maybe have younger kids, do we have any resources, like other than obviously speaking with the teacher, if they're still kind of unsure of how to navigate, do we have any resources? or someone that you could contact? Um, so at the elementary level, um, I, I would definitely suggest, uh, you know, reaching out, starting with the teacher. Um, you know, if, if they're having, you know, trouble accessing, say the Google links or, or any of the Google meets, uh, it, it could be, uh, it could be a link issue. It could possibly be, um, you know, just a, a simple um, user error or maybe something the way, you know, something was presented. Um, but yes, absolutely. If they're struggling with that, if it's more of um, struggling to uh, manage the Edgenuity platform at the middle school, high school level, um, we do have individuals that they could reach out to. Um, Ms. Sheedy at the high school, Ms. Gibbs and Ms. Bartolo at the middle school level, but certainly uh, they can reach out if they have our contact uh, information more readily available, they can either reach out to me or, or Ms. Richards. Well, I didn't know if you had like, so I know the teachers did PD a lot. I didn't know if you had something basic for like a Google Classroom type. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, I, maybe I misunderstood your question. Yes, so we, we did put together resources. Uh, we didn't want it to necessarily get lost in some of the recent communication. Uh, so Mr. Swenson uh, will be sending out uh, and we'll be posting it to the website. We have pre uh, prepared a, a Google Doc full of resources. It addresses Google Meet, uh, Google Classroom. There's some tutorial videos. Uh, I apologize, uh, Ms. King, I, I maybe misunderstood what you were asking, but yes, we, we, we do have that information. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions for the educational report? Seeing and I did, I did want to just add, uh, Mr. Dolan, Mr. Marrero, just to your point. I know Mr. Swenson uh, indicated that's the direction we're going in uh, for, for um, snow days. Uh, and it, we have every reason to believe right now that that, that is the plan. The commissioner has verbalized that, but uh, I did say that. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, it's okay. Yep. Uh, the commissioner has, has verbalized that, uh, but we're still waiting for official word in writing before we move in that direction. And then, you know, we, we do have to kind of uh, flush out on our end, uh, work out the details of what, what exactly that will look like. Um, you know, we don't want to necessarily have multiple models of learning um, out there. Uh, so, you know, we, we wanted to either mirror what a, a a cohort A day would look like or a cohort B or potentially what that remote day on Wednesday would look like just so it's it's consistent so when we call um, okay tomorrow is a snow day it becomes a remote day well is it a remote A day is it a remote B day or is it the kind of that remote Wednesday so we'll, we'll work that out and make sure we communicate that to parents so they know exactly if, if we are able to go in that direction what a snow day would really uh, look like for our students. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Powers. Appreciate that. Um, next on the agenda, I'd like to entertain a motion to take item F, personnel report out of order. We are joined tonight by Mrs. Gormley for the last time. Uh, she is in the building, um, and uh, we would like for her to join us to give her final personnel report to the committee. So I will take a motion to move item F out of order. Yes. Moved by Mr. Marrera, second by Mrs. Holbrook. Roll call vote, Mr. Florence. Aye. Mr. Gelfi. Aye. Mr. Hammond. Aye. Mrs. Holbrook. Aye. Mrs. King. Aye. Mr. Marrera. Aye. 
Dr. Kremendowski? Aye. Chair votes aye. Mrs. Gormley, for the last time, as our manager of human resources, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dolan, Superintendent of School Committee member. For this last honor of mine, um, it's, it's been a pleasure to serve the committee under you, and um, I will miss you all. I might not miss the meetings. <laughs> You're always welcome to join us again any night. <laughs> So first of all, I'd like to um, introduce my, my replacement, Lisa Cordero. Lisa has worked here at BR as my administrative assistant for four years. She then left in 2018 to gain a stronger knowledge base for the HR field and returns to BR from Dennis Yarmouth, where she was the director of human services for the past two years. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology and an associate's degree in early childhood education. Lisa also obtained her credentials at SHRM, uh, SHRM CP, which is a Society for HR Management Certified Professional. She has over 14 years excuse me, of HR experience in public education. I'd like to invite her up to say a few words. Thank you, Mary. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you all for the opportunity to, to come here back to VR. Um, it's great to see a lot of the same people here when I, and, uh, when I left, and it was great to have such a warm welcome. I want to thank especially Mr. Swenson and Mr. Powers for um, again giving me the opportunity. I'm really looking forward to working with you all. and. Um, Thank you, Mary, for everything you've done for me because you've been a great mentor, giving you lots of guidance. And even when I was down in life, she was readily available to help. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I had to keep the training. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we're, we're winding on down to the last, um, hopefully, knock on wood, retirees for the year. Um, at the high school, we have Kathleen Castro, a remote teacher, uh, remote learning teacher for special education, the one year appointment. Uh, Linda Thomas, school adjustment counselor, um, and Brian McNamara, the new custodian. At the Rainier Middle School, Kevin Kurt, remote learning teacher for special education, and Brian Anderson is the new custodian there. At the Williams Intermediate School, Brian Guy, has been reassigned from a long-term sub to a full-time custodian. And Robert Wooster is also been hired as a custodian. At the Mitchell Elementary School, Crystal Rich, grade three long-term sub, Amy Herrera, an education support professional, and Stephanie Preston, an ESP for the preschool. At La Liberty, Beth Buckley, grade two remote learning <coughs> teacher has been reassigned. Jennifer Bain, grade three, remote learning teacher. Matt Santos, grade four, remote learning teacher. And Kimberly Day, building-based assistant. And the superintendent's also received the following resignations. Lisa Crowley, ESP at the preschool. Kendall Silverston, ESP at Mitchell. Patricia Gormley, long-term sub at Merrill. And Paul Santos, uh, custodian at the building. And that concludes my final report for you. I'll still be around for a little while. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And I said to Mary um, several times this week with the different meetings that we've had to say goodbye to her that. We appreciate everything that she's done for us as a district to help to move us forward uh, in, in terms of our uh, human resource department. And I have said, as wonderful as, as Lisa is, we're going to have a great replacement to replace a position for member of the person. So we appreciate it very much. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thank have a great night. All right, we'll go back to our agenda of order. Um, Mr. Swenson, we will 
a report from the superintendent. Thank you. Um, I'll stop first with uh, the Mitchell Elementary School project. Um, as we have reported out, demolition phase is complete. We are in really good shape from a timeline perspective. The 90% constructing documents have been forwarded to the mass, um, the mass uh, teacher, I'm sorry, the mass uh, school building authority, MSBA. Uh, they did get back to us with a few clarifying questions, and I'm happy to report out that we um, answered all those questions along with myself and Mr. McNally from uh, Daedalus and also RDA uh, through Gene Raymond. And we got confirmation today that they did receive our 90% uh, uh, construction review comments. They'll be reviewing those and any additional questions will be sent to us. Um, we will then begin our 100% construction bid documents, which is very exciting. And that will take place over the course of the next few weeks into um, mid to end October. And the bidding and award process will begin between the end of October in December of 2020, with construction beginning in uh, 2020 through July of 2022. So we are, this is really trying to come to life now. Uh, so it's very exciting. Um, our next school building committee meeting will be at 5.30 p.m. on October 19th, and they are all virtual, and the link uh, is posted with the agenda. And it will be meeting 48, and we'll talk about schedule and bidding and the 100% uh, construction document bid set process. Then we'll have another meeting on December 7th, 2020. And during that time, meeting 49, we'll review the general contractor and FSB bids, approve the bid to be awarded, and review the schedule moving forward. And we'll have meeting 50, uh, which is still a date to be determined, which will probably be determined probably on the October 19th uh, meeting. And that will uh, talk about the construction phase. So again, thank you to all the members. I know that Mr. Dolan and Mrs. Holbrook serve on that committee. Thank you to all the other members of the school building committee. Um, we're, you know, this project right now, knock on wood, is on time and under budget. It was a great uh, phrase to be able to say aloud and um we just want to keep moving this thing through even with everything else we're dealing with right now so kudos to um the members of that committee and thank you to all of the uh residents of bridgewater and uh, our town manager um mr dutton for uh you know approving this project and um, allowing us to put a put a building in place that's going to be really state-of-the-art for our children here in bridgewater so very excited Second piece, I'd like to talk a little bit about <clears throat> transportation. Um, as you know, due to uh, COVID-19, that transportation had guidelines similar to what we have within our classrooms. So there were some social distancing um, arrangements we needed to make. I just want to thank Mrs. Ellen George for all of her hard work with Lucini bus lines uh, to in order to ensure that we have safe um, buses for our students to travel on. Right now, I would say that our ridership is somewhat low. Um, a lot of people may see buses uh, going by with, with not many students on them. I just want folks to understand, however, that because we are a regional district and we receive regional reimbursement for transportation at any time, a student that is eligible for transportation can come back to our buses. So we gotta make sure that we keep space available. And again, at that space available, does not impact the social distancing guidelines set forth by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Knock on wood, everything seems to be going very well. I've spoke to um, this is a, Mr. George on a, on a daily basis since the start of school, and everything's gone, you know, that's spot on as to what we hoped it would be. So kudos again to Mrs. George and all the efforts that she's done, along with Gail Howard from um, Lucini Bus Lines. At one of our last meetings, um, we did have a um, suggestion recommendation from the committee for us to kind of walk through a little bit of a snapshot of what the social distancing spacing is looking like um, 
within all of our schools. Um, I did meet with our administrative team uh, last week and we created a template for them to uh, fill out that talks about um, your, basically, first and foremost, the spacing, which you'll see in a little bit when we share the screen, is between four and uh, six feet throughout the district, the minimum being four. But you'll see that a majority of our spacing is usually between that five and six foot mark. I would say too, we'll look a little bit at the cohorts because I've asked them to separate out cohort A, cohort B numbers, also including cohort C students, which we know come to us either um, four to five days a week. And when you see some of those numbers, you'll realize that even though the high end number is set up, the, the, the classroom is set up for that high end number, sometimes when we do have that lower end cohort come in, like the difference between 12 students on cohort A and seven on cohort B, even though it may say four feet, the time when we have more space, we're allowing the students obviously to space out um, even further. So with that being said, Mr. Shantz, if you could please share the screen. We'll start first with um, the high school. The high school, uh, um, Ms. Uh, Watson did a wonderful job, but she sent an 11 page document to us, and I didn't want you to have to sit through an 11 page document. So I want to take page one of that. So if you look at the top row, and you go, you have room, you have the block, which is the rotating schedule at the high school, but you see the spacing. You see that the spacing, depending upon the size of the classroom, and the amount of students within the classroom during that time is anywhere between four and six feet. And for cohort A versus cohort B, there can be a differential on any given day between 14 students being the high end and actually four students on some days um, based upon students who have chosen to remote learn or uh, whatever it would be in terms of the actual class size for that particular course. Um, if we go to the next slide, see Bridgewater Middle School. It's tough for you folks to see it. And I know you have it in your packets though. Um, Bridgewater Middle School, um, if you look across the board, they are at four feet, but again, you know, the differential between cohort A some days where you have a max of 15 students versus a cohort B where you might have seven students come in. Anytime that we have the space available to go beyond that four feet, our principals and teachers um, are doing so. So I just want um, folks to be aware of that. Um, we currently have about 26 cohort C students at Bridgewater Middle School, and we have 85 remote learning students uh, for BR at home for the seventh and eighth grade at uh, Bridgewater Middle School. And at the high school, I know we already went past the high school, but their remote numbers, just for you folks to know, grade nine has 41, grade 10, 53, grade 11, 30, grade 12, 15 students at the high school for remote learners. At RMS, um, it may be difficult to see, but you have, again, have it in your packet. It is um, basically five to six feet uh, across the board. There is one sub separate program um, where the classroom is a little bit smaller uh, than the rest, so they're at four feet. But again, even at the four, five to six feet, if they can expand out, they go beyond the six foot mark uh, if it allows. Uh, right now, there are 38 cohort C students at RMS. There are 96 uh, BR at home, um, so I'm sorry, 84 uh, BR at home students from the Rainham Middle School. The Williams Intermediate School, again, similar to uh, the Bridgewater Middle School. Um, and again, this is all dependent upon square footage and amount of students within each uh, Gates cohort. They are at four feet across the board. However, again, there's a differential between say 14 students in cohort A and some days in cohort B, five students. So again, when they have the opportunity to go beyond that four foot mark, they are absolutely doing so. And at the Williams Intermediate School, 
we have 117 students that are currently uh, participating in the BR at home uh, program, and we have 40 students who are our cohort C students. Law Liberty Elementary School. They, um, it's, it ranges from anywhere from five, from four to six feet, depending upon, again, square footage of the classroom and size of uh, the grade level. I know the fourth grade is quite large at um, Law Liberty, so um, Mrs. Hot Reyes has had to kind of go to the four foot mark in some of those classrooms. But again, if the opportunity presents itself, we go beyond that four to six foot mark uh, whenever we can. Cohort C students, we have 46 cohort C students um, at Law Liberty and 96 students at Law Liberty are participating in the BR at Home program. Mitchell Elementary School, my name is Mr. Brad. Um, all of their classrooms are averaging five to six feet. Um, they currently have in cohort C about 98 students. They do have um, several sub-separate programs that we house here at the Mitchell Elementary School. And a total of 138 students are participating in the BR at Home program from the Mitchell Elementary School. Finally, the Merrill Elementary School and across the board, Ms. Westell has all of the classrooms set at six feet. Um, and they currently have uh, 10 cohort C students that attend the uh, Merrill Elementary School and a total of 22 uh, BR at home students that are participating in remote learning in grades K and 1. So just kind of a snapshot, an overview of where we are. A majority of the district, again, is at um, you know the five to six foot mark. There are some that are at that minimum of four. But again, expanding when they can um, on a daily basis, depending upon the number of students in each individual cohort. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Johnson about the Mitchell project or um, our, our square footage and distance between the students? Uh, I do have a question. Okay. Um, is this available on our school committee site or the district at all for parents that may want to? We can definitely do it. We have it in our Google Drive. So, so we put it for transparency, yeah. then we can all want to look at it. Yeah, all of our documents for the, that's a great question, Mr. Murray. For those on the, on the call or on, at the meeting, all of these documents will be shared uh, tomorrow morning uh, now that they are public record because we are using them at this meeting. So they'll be available for you to, to get uh, tomorrow. So that's it. Thank you, Mr. Silver. Yes, I did have a question. Sure. Um, Mr. Swenson, under the Merrill School, I noticed that you have five Bridgewater students yes. there. Could you explain why you have Bridgewater students? Over I sure will. So our remote numbers started to climb uh, exponentially over, over the course of the last week or so on the Bridgewater side uh, primarily. So as those class sizes started to creep up into the high, to the mid to high 30s, almost teetering 40, um, as parents from the Bridgewater side wanted to go into remote learning, we decided to take the students from the Bridgewater side and put them in the cohorts with the Rainham teachers, thinking that we're fully remote, so it's really not housed to an actual uh, building. And um, it's worked to this point. You know, we have gotten positive feedback from the teachers and from uh, the parents. Now we are exploring, because our numbers continue to grow, we are exploring possibly adding additional staff to our remote K-5 uh, remote learning program. If that does take place and we do get these positions in, what we're thinking is to have the conversation with those parents who are currently Bridgewater parents in uh, Bridgewater students in the on the Rainham side and see if they would like to be moved into um, a different uh, class on the Bridgewater side. So we'll have those conversations with, uh, with them. But really was to kind of offset some of the high class sizes for our remote learners on the Bridgewater side. Okay. 
Thank you. Good question. I, I do have one follow-up. I'm sorry. Uh, I have one question. Um, the cohort C students, so yes. do they get added into the class with the cohort A? Yes. And the cohort, so they'll be like, let's say those three cohort C class uh, students, and the, uh, so actually in those nine cohort A students, it'd be 12 kids in the classroom on that cohort A day. Yep. And then cohort B day, if there's eight cohort B kids, those same three students would also be added in. Just so. Just for numbers wise, it's a little more clear. Yes. But they're, they're not in those rooms the whole time. Sometimes they're not in the whole time. They might transition in, say, for ELA or for the math block. But that's why we kind of put that section. So you see eight students in cohort B, but then you see three in cohort C. It's actually, there's potentially 11 students. 11. That. It's not a class of eight, it's a, it's a class of 11. This is correct. At any yeah. given time, it's a Mr. Dolan's point, yeah. because they're usually a sub separate program. Or they might be an ESL student who's incorporated within that, that group, but maybe have some pull-out services for ESL throughout the day, too. Um, those numbers may fluctuate throughout the course of the day. All right, so I'll just clarify. So it wouldn't be eight students. It would actually be 11 or whatever. I'm just picking Basically, one class of students. Yeah, right. So yeah, there's So if you see that, that's why we put that cohort C number there yeah. next to that individual grade. Yeah, or so actually add it in yep. at certain times of the day. Correct. Right. Um, on the high school one, because it stands out on page one of the high school, the lecture hall, looks yes. like in blocks 4A and 6A, they're empty all uh, through those blocks. I didn't know if the uh, lecture hall was being used for study or is it actually being used for a class? Both. So there, are, there are some teachers that use that act, as an actual space to teach, but it is uh, at some sometimes throughout the course of the day being used as uh, a study as well. So it's kind of a communal space that we're able to utilize in, in a multitude of ways. The reason I brought that up is if there's a possibility, I know we have some room staff that's <coughs> four feet uh, instead of six feet. And those, it looks like after those two blocks, uh, the hall is empty. Maybe we can shift some space if those teachers want to utilize the lecture hall when it's not being used. That way they're not in their small room. So sure. I don't know if that's any so, These are um, all the type of conversations we're having with our admin now. Right now, they all feel as though they're in good shape from a, from a spacing uh, perspective, but that's something that I could pass through. Absolutely. You could, like I said, it's just, it's <laughs> nice to know that we have the flexibility of using that large room. Yep. Um, so it'd be nice to see all blocks filled up in that large room. The only thing with smart too, you know, go ahead. Unfortunately, going to be times when we may be short some coverages mm -hmm. and we may have to uh, maybe utilize that as a, a communal space to allow maybe two groups to go into uh, safely. Um, and that, you know, luckily we haven't really have to kind of tap into that yet, but that's also something to think about as well. So we kind of want to be able to be a little bit flexible with our communal spaces within our. Uh, Understandable. You want to use it, but you want to have a reserve on standby too. If you need some place. Just happen to be if we're short of some, and for some reason we have to. You know, obviously, we would distance them by grade or by class uh, throughout in that space. But that might have to be one of the communal spaces we use in a, in a pitch. Should we need it. I have a question actually about the Mitchell School. I don't know if anybody had a chance to change directions. Um, Given that we probably would never design a school based on COVID, but now that you've sort of lived there for a few months, is there anything about that current design that you would suggest changing, or is there anything that you feel would need to be addressed, given that this could be around for a little? I'm just curious. Yeah, the technology. I, I, the, talk, or, the talk of uh, the HVAC has come up quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, so, you know, give, yeah. this is the time now to. to the, the, the one thing about the HVAC system there, just because of where we are in terms of <clears throat> the age of all of our other buildings, the HVAC system that's going to go in there is 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 right now, you know, somewhat state of the art in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. But we have had some mm -hmm. other conversations about you know a MERV thirteen, a MERV fourteen, you know, type which was really kind of hospital quality type HVACs, but also kind of the filter systems that we're utilizing there a little bit um, higher end. So that. Definitely has been part of our conversation during our uh, school building meeting. Uh, so. Thank you. Great. 
meetings that uh, the past two meetings this yes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to have a high, uh, side hustle uh, time. <laughs> it's a good time to do it as opposed yeah. to. You know. Any other questions from Mr. Swanson? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to. Uh, I would like to so we'll yeah. add one more. So I know Mr. Gelfi kind of talked a little bit about a video. Do we have the video, oh, Mr. Right. Sean's yeah. uploaded? Um, um, so basically, what we have encouraged our teachers to do is to obviously, you know, have conversations with their students, have conversations with their teams at the middle school, um, and talk a little bit about our new normal, uh, wearing masks, about the, um, you know, hygiene type strategies and, you know, health uh, mitigating type strategies that we are putting in place. So as Mr. Powers and I traveled around uh, during the last few weeks, we saw some of the teams presenting uh, this information. And you know, we thought about it too in the summer that you know it's a situation where we want our students to feel welcome and safe and comfortable when they're being taught about something that is really a serious situation, but we didn't want it to be. Heavy. Um, our teachers have done a fabulous job. And I would just speak for my three um, and my kindergarten student who you know, tells me now that I'm wearing my mask wrong, um, <laughs> that you know they've done a wonderful job of, of, of being able to disseminate very important and sometimes heavy information, but in a way that you know I felt as though was you know from the heart. So there was one that we happened to walk into. Uh, one day, and I asked if I could see a copy of the video, if I could borrow it and show it here. So I just kind of wanted to share this with the committee and the members of the audience. So hopefully it works. We're buffering. <laughs> Oh, good, Mr. Johns. It's still, it's downloading. All right. Okay. So, uh, how, much, how, how long do we think we got? I'm, I'm not sure how long. <laughs> so, why don't we do this? Because I've actually, we've we've seen the video, some of us around the table, um, and it ties in really well with the next topic, which is public health. Perfect. Um, so, why don't we show it after? If Mr. Shantz, if you could continue to have that download, <laughs> um, we'll take it from there. Uh, so right now we'll move to DPH matrix update, uh, Board of Health, Mr. Tannis from the town of Rainham and Mr. Badger from the town of Bridgewater. Um, if you could stand by, we'll unmute your lines. I would make him the host. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Mr. Badger, is that you? That's me. How are you doing? Mr. Tannison? We're just getting Mr. Tannison. Mr. Badger, stand by. Got it. Michael, it's Matthew, or Matt. Matthew's iPhone, is that you, Mr. Tannis? <clears throat> no, that's Matt Rushton. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Rushton. <laughs> You're welcome, sir.
How do you spell his last name? T A N I S. Uh, -A -N -I -S? While we while we look for Mr. Tannis, Mr. Badger, why don't you um, go ahead if you could and give us an update on the latest numbers? I know at six o'clock this evening those numbers were released by the state. Um, Bridgewater. Uh, Bridgewater. Um, so Mr. Badger is from Bridgewater. He will give an update on the town of Bridgewater status, and we will go from there to Lane. Mr. Tannis, right. uh, Mr. Badger. So currently. I went over the uh, report today with my infectious disease nurse. We have active 10 cases in the town of Bridgewater, only which two of those are in isolation are Bridgewater and of students. Um, the rest are either local citizens uh, or university students or another student in a separate school system. Um, as of today, we still have 10 active isolation with only two being Bridgewater and of students. One of those students is off of isolation as of tomorrow. So that will bring us down to one act of isolation. And that's the report I got from my infectious disease nurse today. However, we do reports every day, check um, our emails every morning, to see if we get any new cases in through the Maven email system. Uh, I know the school nurses check their list as well. So the only advice I can give is just constant communication between my nurse, the school nurses with the school. Um, because this is always evolving every week, every day. That's what we've seen over six months now. The guidelines that are put out by the DPH, I always recommend to parents to check them on a daily basis if they can, once a week at least, um, because they're always evolving and changing guidelines and information. And that's been hard, hard for us, the local health departments to keep up with. But thank God we've got, I've got an infectious disease nurse who's great at her job. And we're able to steal Marie Fahey out of retirement to help us out a little bit with contact tracing. Um, because with schools back in, we're going to need all the help we can get just in case anything happens um, with an increase in cases like it did for a three to four week period it did in the spring. Uh, we were seeing in that period, we were seeing anywhere from five to seven cases per day coming in over two and a half to three week per period. So we did hit that curve and then it just dropped off over the summertime. So hopefully, in the fall, we know flu is going to be out there again. We know other dis diseases and illnesses will be out there. So we'll be tracking all this for the next few months. Um, if there's anything that comes up that's of concern, of course, we'll have my nurse reach out to the school nurses immediately, and we'll have to have future discussions on that end. But for now, I think with our weekly meetings, we can be on top of this with constant communication. So what we have, what we have done is we've uh, set up a weekly meeting every Tuesday with members of uh, the central office staff, our nurse leader, Claire Grennan, Mr. Badger, Mr. Tannis, uh, Mr. Badger's nurses, Mrs. Uh, Behe and Mrs. Panos. Um, and basically we've reviewed all of the data that's coming across, um, you know, our desks here within the district over the course of the last two weeks. Over the course of the last two weeks, throughout the, uh, the towns of both Bridgewater and Rainham, we've had about 15 uh, cases that um, have been brought to us. So the communication in the last few days has been, where does that put us in terms of our district with our towns based upon the metrics that have been set forth by the state? I've, I've um, presented those metrics here at a previous meeting. We have the unshaded area, which means you're in really good shape. Green, you're good. Yellow, you should start to really kind of contemplate what, what your next move is. And then if you're in the red um, for a 14 day period, you're really suggesting that you look at the model that you are in and possibly transition if you are in a full reentry or a hybrid model to possibly going remote. Now, let me state this. It doesn't mean remote for the year. It means following that matrix then throughout to see where those numbers go for the next 14 days. And if there's a reduction in those numbers, we would then transition back into a hybrid model. So I've said to my staff, we may be on a roller coaster ride throughout the course uh, of this school year. What has been concerning of the last few weeks 
has been the number of student cases within our uh, communities to the point where I, we really anticipated today we would be in the red. Luckily, we're still in the yellow in Bridgewater, but we have elevated to yellow in the town of Rainham. Now, when we started school, Rainham was unshaded and Bridgewater, I believe, was green. So just in a two week span, we're both yellow. So even though this is better news than we anticipated, it's not great news because we've got to keep really truly a watchful eye on this because if we continue, these numbers continue to grow over time within a 14 day span and we are elevated into the red, that's when we're gonna to start to have to have some conversations about next moves and transitioning from our hybrid to a possible fully remote. Again, not for the year, but it could be two weeks if that, um, you know, those numbers come down, but if they don't, it could be two months. So um, it's important that we have established this relationship with our local health agents and we're having this ongoing communication throughout the school year so we can keep, you know, definitely, uh, you know, a finger on the pulse of where we are within our communities. Now, people have to realize too, this is not just about student cases, it's our community's cases. So it's students that, you know, in Bridgewater attend the university, it's um, the adult population. There are some nursing home uh, 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 establishments with both of our districts that those numbers may um, increase our overall uh, town numbers. One thing that I find concerning is that <clears throat> we have some students that are attending college, say in Boston, who are testing positive, but because their home is Bridgewater or Rainium, the town has to report those numbers um, on, their, on their scale. It wouldn't be reported to say Boston or Providence where the student is attending school. So there are a multitude of factors that we need to look at when we are determining any type of transition from one model to the next. But the concerning piece for me right now, the amount of students that we have had that have converted in the last two weeks being 15. Um, I did put out some information yesterday to the parents. In no way, shape, or form was this in any way pointing a finger at any parents about any decisions that they have made. It's basically about we need to keep our kids safe. And I get it. You know, folks say, well, if a student contracts, usually it does not become a situation where they end up in the ICU or become a fatal situation. But you have to remember, they're entering school buildings with other students that may have pre-existing conditions, staff that may have pre-existing conditions, or staff who may be in that wheelhouse where COVID is a real issue. So we are in all this together. We have to make sure that we're all doing our part to keep all of our community communities at large and our school community healthy and safe. So just so wanted to put that out there tonight. Very good. Before we go to you, Mitt, for questions, Mr. Swenson, it looks like Mr. Tannis is on. Excellent. All right, good evening. Sorry about that. I a uh, little mix up on, on the names there. Um, so for, for Rainham, um, in, in the last two weeks, I have had uh, 14 new positive cases, uh, five of those which uh, are Bridgewater Rainham school children. Um, and and uh, two, two of those are from long-term care facilities. One is a school age child, but does not attend uh, a BR school. And uh, the, the, re the remaining six are not school aged, uh, just general adults or those, uh, as Mr. Swenson had said, some, some college kids that have been reported to Rainham, even though they don't live here. Uh, that 14 uh, is, is definitely an, an increase. Uh, I think that's probably more cases in the last three weeks than we had over the course of July and August combined. So that's, that's concerning. Um, with that, uh, this, this week today, with, with the new data, the, the two week data, uh, we did get pushed, Rainham got pushed from green to yellow, which is the higher category. Um, basically, the yellow means that, that there's been re a reported between four and eight cases per 100,000 uh, in, in the population, and, and that's uh, a calculated denominator set by the state. So uh, once you hit 
uh, eight or more, uh, that's when you go to the red. So I'd, I'd really like to, to be back into the gray and hopefully, um, you know, with, with good hygiene and, and public health practices, general the general population will, will be able to get back to the gray. Um, so we're currently at a, a 6.2 uh, per 100,000 incident rate over the last 14 days. Um, so with, with that, I, I think it's very important that we just stay in, in good communication with the superintendent and the and school administration. As Mr. Swenson had said, we, we are doing the, the weekly meetings, which I, I find to be extremely helpful, uh, understanding where the school is at, uh, and, and as well as Bridgewater and, and Rainham, and just have a general discussion, make sure we're staying on top of, of all the cases. Um, so with that, I again also address there, uh, one, one major factor that I, I am looking at is, you know, Rainham could be pushed from green to yellow, yellow to red, um, and just where those cases are coming from, as, as I'm sure most people are aware, early in the spring, later in the spring, the, uh, lot, a lot of our cases were, were coming from long-term long care facilities and, and not so much the, the general population of Rainham. So that's one factor to, to really look at, um, you know, if, if we do increase to, to a red, where, where are those cases? Um, and, and just have discussion with, with school administration regarding that. Uh, and, and one other factor to, to look at is, is where potential uh, transmission of, of the virus is, is happening. Is it predominantly seen, more predominantly more seen to be from the school setting or is there potential for out of school setting um, so it's, it's just communication with uh, the, the kids and the parents that test positive, find out where they've been, who they've been with, and, and try to do some investigative work. Um, so I think there's just a, a lot of pieces, a lot of communication, and I, I think we, we definitely have good communication at this point between uh, Rainham, Bridgewater, and, and the school administration. Thank you, Mr. Kennis. Okay, so um, as a result of Mr. Swenson's message out to families yesterday, we did receive several emails over the past 24 hours. Um, I have compiled some of those questions. Um, we'll discuss those, but I want to give the committee time to ask their questions first before we get to the questions that um, families asked. Um, and some of those questions may be covered by your questions. So um, anybody have any questions either for Mr. Swenson Mr. Badger or Mr. Kass? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't know who would um, handle this question best, uh, but I, I could have sworn I heard Mr. Tannis say that uh, college students that are living at the university or college are impacting the numbers to their hometown. Is that correct? Yes. So, so a resident student, I just want to make sure I understand this. So a student is living in the dorm at UMass, Amherst, but they're from Bridgewater or Rainham, they're impacting our numbers, even though they're not physically living in the town. And they're probably quarantining at the school. Some are, some are being sent home actually. That's right. Mr. 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 Yes. If I may, I, I don't believe it's it's all of them. There's been a lot of discussion between uh, Mass DPH and, and the towns and, and it's supposed to work so that this, the, the case is reported with the town that the student is in, is in college and it's supposed to get reported to the town which they spend at least six months or more of their time, which for college kids would, would be the school. Uh, there have been several instances where it's the, the, the case has been rooted to the town, uh, it, you know, which they, their hometown instead of the college town. Um, I don't believe it's everyone, but but there have been a, a good handful of cases that have been uh, improperly rooted, shall we say. Um, that being said, also some of the kids are being sent home to quarantine. That may trigger the the rerouting of of the case to the town in which they, you know, their their hometown instead of the college town. So um, I don't know if that helps at all. It, it helps a little bit. It's just I I would hope that the universities communicating to the towns if the child's going home, I understand it affecting the, 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 the town's numbers. But I would hate to see 
or do you want to rain them go for a, from a yellow to a red over one person that's physically not back in their hometown and they're being quarantined at their school I think because that's the number's being retorted, uh, reported in Yeah, and at that time, I think that's when we had the conversations with the local health agents to say, similar, we said, similar to one here on the Bridgewater side, if there were ever a breakout at the prison, that it was isolated in the prison, and it raised the community's numbers. Well, for the most part, it's impacting the general public. It may impact some of the guards that may live and the, the correction officers that may live in town. But for the most part, if that elevated us to red, I think we were gonna have those conversations and say, well, it's really not a situation where it's impacting the community at large. So do we necessarily need to shut down the schools at that point? So I think we are gonna have those conversations. I don't want people to think it's a situation that goes to red and there aren't gonna be a multitude of different scenarios and conversations that are gonna be vetted through. The spike in the last two weeks, 14 days, has been primarily students. That was our concern. And that was our concern because it was such a high number. We felt as though, going, even yesterday at yesterday's meeting, we were all anticipating today that Bridgewater would probably be in the red. And we said that rain would at least be elevated to the yellow. Luckily, the news we got tonight is great. That is good. Let me say it's good. It's not great because we're still in the yellow. We still got to keep our eye on the prize here and make sure that we're all doing our part to make sure that those numbers don't increase over the next seven to 14 days to put us in the red, which would then put us again in that area where we might have to discuss a fully remote option. So if I'm understanding this, uh, if I'm understanding exactly what you're saying, because I, uh, I know this is definitely parents that are listening, this is definitely a concern to them about, about the, uh, the, the yellow, the green, the red. So if the towns of Bridgewater and Random are triggered into a red, it's not an automatic, we're going remote. It's a let's look at to why we're in the red and kind of figure out from there. So I think some parents, I know the last 24 hours, we've gotten a lot of emails um, and their concerns is what's the trigger mechanism? Right? Is there an automatic red? And it's like, all right, there's no more conversation. You're red, you're red. It is what it is. Or you're red, let's figure out why, like you said, the prison population, maybe a uh, 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 Life care. The life care center in Raynham, you know, uh, you know, you know, um, the nursing home in Bridgewater, there are those scenarios where those could be isolated incidents that do not impact the community. So I think parents understanding that will make them feel a little bit better knowing that just because what's on the state website says you were triggered into a red, there may be underlying circumstances why that red is red that may not trigger or going forward about. But when you when you are elevating, say on the rain side from a green to a yellow, and it has to do with possibly five cases of students. That's a whole other situation that we have to discuss. Right, absolutely. You know, so we will have those discussions, obviously, but our concern was the amount of students that had tested within the last 14 days. We, were, we felt as though that might elevate us into the red on the Bridgewater side. That was our major, our major concern. Mr. Gellar. Is there a situation where if there was a concentration of positive acts one school, mm -hmm. is there a situation where just that school would go remote and not the rest of the district because they're still in good shape? So again, we'd have to look at those numbers. There is a possibility of that. The only concern we have is we have siblings that may be in other buildings. Remember, we're also a region, a regional school district. So we may have um, students that may be in other schools throughout the district and regional programs that, that may in, you know, come into play in terms of transmission uh, rates and the rest of those. But if we're looking at it saying, okay, it's one, basically one school, um, you know, at that point, could we look to shut that down? Yes, I believe Natick did do that, I think this week at the high school. The concerning piece to us, where we're having a lot of numbers at the high school we did have some numbers that trickled into other buildings because of siblings converting. So we have to take that into consideration that we may have siblings in other buildings that may be in, impacting those buildings as well. But yes, all those conversations will be had. The last thing we would want to do is shut everything down if it wasn't necessary. We, we'd have to really look at the situation and say, you know, that technical effect of is it reaching out to other areas? 
And if the answer is yes, then we may have to close out multiple sites. If we feel like it's kind of reaching out to, into all of our buildings, you know, we may have to shut down the entire district. So we're hoping that it's never a case for any of these scenarios. But, you know, we really have to be cognizant of the fact that we began the school year unshaded in green. Now we're yellow and yellow two and a half weeks later. So I want folks just to be really keeping their eye on that. Let's have our finger on the pulse of where our communities are at. And again, it's not school age kid numbers. And I want parents to understand that too. It's your community's numbers, your overall community's numbers. There were some communities that wanted to go hybrid from the beginning, but their community numbers raised to the red and they were forced into remote to start. It's mostly some of our urban areas that we're seeing that in. But now we're seeing some of that in suburban areas, such as in Natick, now here at BR. Um, are students at the high school included in the Bridgewater total, or it depends on which town they live in? So, so that's good. The, it's the town they live in. Okay. It's not that they, if you're a Rainham student attending Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School, it would impact Bridgewater. That's where you attend school. But again, that's why it's important for people to realize that the matrix are based upon community numbers, not school numbers, student numbers. Yes, uh, Mr. Swenson, what is the protocol for a family if a member of the family has symptoms or is tested positive? What should that family be doing? So if we have a test positive, mm -hmm. what will happen is, and I can ask one of the local health agents can chime in at any time, that information goes to the Mass Department of Health and then is disseminated to the local health agents through the maiden system that Mr. Badger just spoke to. At that point, if it were a, are you talking about a, a, a student, a parent? A student. Student at that point tests positive. We at that point have to figure out if they, when if they tested positive, we go back 48 hours, figure out were they physically in our building? If that is the case, what ends up happening is we start a close contact tracing, which means that we pull all of our seating charts from all of our um, from all of our classrooms that that student is in. If that student, he or she rides the school bus, we take that information and then we start to create a circle of close contacts around that individual. That's in school. There might be some close contacts out in the community as well for students that attend other schools, um, it may be adult population folks, could be parents, grandparents, whatever it may be. And at that point, that student um, then obviously um, is quarantined for the time that they have to um, quarantine. But we also have to take all of those close contact students and they need to quarantine too for 14 days as well. Okay, and what about the family members? Like family if members, they have yeah. siblings, can they still go to school? If they have tested positive, they need to they need to quarantine as well. You're only positive until you're positive. So I know a lot of people say, well, what about a close contact that's quarantining? Does that sibling have to quarantine? No. That sibling is allowed to go until that student who has been identified as a close contact tests positive. Once that happens, that sibling needs to go into quarantine and then the circle of close contacts now goes to that new positive case. Thank you. Uh, currently, how many students do we have quarantining because they've been ex possibly exposed? Not that they have it because we were told that we had 15, 16 students that had it. How say, many is that impacted in their circle now? Yeah, I want to say at one stage, we were about 75 at the high school. 75 students were quarantining until they were sure they didn't have it. Yep. But even if during their quarantine, they test negative, we still ask that they finish out their full 14 days. Because at any given time, if a student goes and say it gets a test day one to say day three, it may give you a negative rating, but then you may become symptomatic days five through uh, 14. Claire Grennan's on, we, we talked about, you know, one case that we know of that the um, individual became symptomatic on day 12. So that's why we want to make sure 
they feel, even if they have, and I know that's tough for parents to hear that, you know, well, I got a test, it's negative. Why do I have to stay out? Because at a given, any given time, they usually say day four or five is the best time to actually be tested. But it, it presents differently in everybody. And it could be a situation that it could present and become symptomatic day 12 of a 14 day quarantine. So. Other questions for me? Mr. Tannis, Mr. Badger, did I do okay? Did I, yeah. I, I think you did very well. I uh, just want to add um, that the, the quarantine date, so say you have um, siblings, one test positive, they both go to, to the schools. Uh, one test positive, the other at the time does not. Uh, that quarantine, the 14 days actually starts on the uh, last day of known exposure, which the viral shedding uh, could be up to 10 days from time of symptom start or uh, positive test. So uh, it, in actuality, a, a student who is on quarantine resides in the same household as, as a, someone else who has tested positive could potentially be out for up to 24 days, that 10 day viral shedding, and then 14 days after that 10 day period. Um, so, because you, you can certainly contract the, the, the virus at any point during that, that viral shed. It's not a, a one time they test positive, they're only infectious that day. So, um, I, I think there's been a lot of communication with, with a lot of the parents, with the, um, the students that have tested positive and, and their household members and, and what it means for their quarantine. Uh, it's, it's often very hard to, uh, to comprehend being out for, for almost a month but to, to be on the, the very safe side, that's un, unfortunately what it, it needs to be for the, the quarantine periods. That's been our rule of thumb so far with siblings and people living with the home, that it's the 10 day shed plus the 14 day quarantine, so it's actually 24 days. And then what happens with those students if they're home for the 14 days? Do they pick up remote, yeah. what happens? They become remote learners, okay. uh, unless they obviously, they're not well enough mm -hmm. to participate. So if I could clarify, do they become remote learners that we are at home yeah. or they within, become... within, within the hybrid cohort that they've been assigned to, right? So, uh, uh, a cohort A and they are remote on the end of the week, they just stay remote. Yeah. Uh, so to save some of their parents some anguish, if you, with the rumors and the whatnot, if I'm sitting next to someone who tests positive, I shouldn't concern myself till someone from the Board of Health contacts me that I've been a close contact or how does that work? I mean, generally, if, if you are aware that you've been in close contact, so 15 minutes or more within six feet of somebody who, who does test positive and that person who tests positive does tell you, hey, I just tested positive. Remember, we were sitting next to each other yesterday. Um, you know, you, you should start your quarantine immediately, not wait for a call from the Board of Health, because it, it could be several days before we get that positive test result and start making phone calls. And there's also certainly cases where, you know, you, you're asking people, you know, who have you been in contact with, you know, during X amount of time, and they could forget that, hey, you know, that day I was sitting next to you. So if you do become aware that, you know, you may have been in close contact with someone that's tested positive, you know, you definitely should not wait for a phone call from, from the health department or, or the state. Uh, you should just start quarantining yourself. Thank you. But if you're not aware of it, and right. the Board of Health will contact the person who is positive, and they'll start the close contact tracing to that individual. And if we find out that it's a student, as the information comes to us through Claire Grant and, and the nurses, we start our close contact tracing for that individual in school. <clears throat> other questions from the committee before I start with the questions we received the email. I just have Don't one other, um, and I guess this is for the um, health agents. Are there any videos? I've noticed some towns have been putting out videos um, once the state comes out with their numbers on Wednesday evenings. And then they take and break that information down for the residents of that town for their particular towns. 
Is anything like that being done in Bridgewater or Rainham for the community at large, just not the school community? I could say for, for Rainham, I, I post the, uh, our, our numbers in a breakdown of, of the numbers uh, cumulative on uh, the health department's webpage, um, try to update it several times a week. Um, I can certainly work with cable if, if um, you know, now that we're back in school and, and try to, to get some understanding with, with the numbers and, and what the red, yellow, green and, and unshaded means, I can certainly work with, uh, with Mike Halen and, and the cable and try to work a timeout just to give a couple minute update uh, weekly or bi-weekly, something like that. I can, I can touch base with them. I think that would be helpful and letting people know about the isolation and about quarantining, what that all means. Because I still think within the community, there's a lot of confusion as well. So if you could do something like that, I think it would be beneficial to both towns. Certainly. Thank yeah, you. And, and just, just a reminder that, you know, our offices are always, you can always get a, a hold of us at the office at any time. Our local websites, feel free, any parent, feel free to call me with questions. I've been getting several questions and I've been able to answer quite a few of those questions. So we're open to any questions at all times. So that's a perfect segue, Mr. Badger. <laughs> the first question from a parent is, um, can the figures we get, and we've talked about those figures now um, and how they're skewed, if you would, towards a town if a college student lives away it hits the home uh, community. Are these numbers, can these figures be appealed to the state at all? Or it, it is what it is and then we are left to um, interpret them? Well, right now we disseminate. I'm disseminating the cases of BSU. We have students at BSU that isolate at a campus dormitory. And we have those that live in town in apartments that isolate. So those accounted toward my numbers. Um, also, we had an issue with the correction facility early on where all those numbers were added right away into my numbers. And an article in the newspaper came out stating we had like over 100 cases, which was untrue. So they had to disseminate that information to separate it from my numbers, from the local numbers. And we had to work. and try to figure out where these are coming from because Maven wasn't reporting them early on. But now they've worked out all the kinks six months later and BSU has, has it down pretty well over there now. So I think with, like I said, it's constant communication, open phone lines, it has helped. Thank you. Um, Next question, um, uh, and this is these questions are more geared towards the school district now. But if uh, you gentlemen wish to, uh, do the, uh, does the DESE matrix matrix indicate or dictate that we move fully remote, or is it guidance? And I, I, looking at it, it says De DESE's expectation for learning model. So they're expecting us to evaluate, to go to remote if we are ready. Um, would that be a? Yes, but again, I think it would have to be a situation where we'd have to have conversations with the local health agents to see if there's some uh, anomalies or things that are skewing our numbers that really, it's not a true community emergency situation. So yes, but if it is a situation where it's just across the general population, the population, student population within our communities and we're red, yes, they're gonna expect us to go into. That's what happened to a lot of districts again at the beginning of the year where they're planning to go hybrid and their communities went into the red and they have to start the year remote. <clears throat> um, the next question is, has DESE looked at, or DESE or DPH actually, now that the state is reopening uh, more and more, uh, have they looked at reevaluating where their matrix are? No. That those this this matrix, and, and again, Eric and, and Matt actually came from Governor Baker, correct? These this this matrix system. This was not something that Desi created. 
DPH. DPH. So it's, it is, have they started to re I think it's so new, but I think they're probably going to stay on path with it for a little bit and to see where the numbers are. Um, well, like, like I stated before, this is ever evolving from week to week. And we have these conference calls with the DPH every Friday. There's always new questions and new concerns. And by that following Monday or Tuesday, there's usually new changes. So as this continues with like the weekly meetings, we'll have to advise on any information that we may have that you may have not received. Thank you. Um, this question is definitely school related. If we do go remote, what would, um, and again, not holding you to anything because we aren't there yet, but uh, if we do go remote, what happens to extracurricular activities? Uh, we, they, they would cease. Okay. Good. That is that question. Um, so, and then to the parents worried, and this is a general statement that I'll make. To the parents who are worried about their children, um, where they're going to go, um, if we do end up fully remote, um, they still have to participate in school uh, during those days. But if at any point they leave home, uh, we strongly encourage uh, that folks have conversations with their kids about social distancing. We are seeing numbers outside of schools because of the work we've done in the summer to protect our kids. And we need that to travel beyond our schools. We need people wearing masks. We need people social distancing, parties, sleepovers, those types of things. And I get it. I've got two kids. This is getting old. We understand that. COVID fatigue is a real thing. We know it. But we, as Derek said, we've got to do this for the greater good. We've got to do this for everybody. It's not just about um, one individual family or one individual child. This is for the greater good. So I, I say that to the, the sort of questions we got. What, if, what do I tell my kid to do during the day? Um, where do you expect my kid to go during the day? They're still learning. If we're fully remote, the expectation is that they're on participating in classwork. And then uh, the final question is, and you sort of alluded to this, uh, if we do go remote, how long will that last? Um, how long will that be evaluated? How often, I should say, will that be evaluated? Uh, say weekly when the numbers come out. And then how long would potentially a remote situation last initially? And I think we'd have to work with the health agents on that one. If we're looking at some type of reduction over a 14-day period, I think that's kind of what we're looking at. You can see right at the bottom there, the deaths and guidelines, it talks about the 14-day. So I would, I would assume we're probably going to be looking at something close to that in terms of a time frame when we're looking at a reduction of numbers. So then I guess the question I throw out to the committee and to you, Mr. Swenson, is at this point in time, now that we are yellow in both towns, Bridgewater has six, Rainingham has 6.2. Is it something we want to um, schedule weekly school committee meetings if we need them, if we go red? It's not something I advocating for? I'm just asking the question. We can always, we can always schedule emergency meetings, correct? It's a dual. Um, so it would be a situation I don't think we need to schedule them. Okay. Um, I think if it is a situation where we have the conversation on the Tuesday, uh, which we have a standing uh, meeting every Tuesday at 10 a.m. with the town administrators, managers, the two health agents, myself, Mr. Powers, uh, our lead nurse, uh, Claire Grennan, and that will be HR will be Ms. Scudero. Um, <clears throat> at that point, if we feel like it's a situation where we'll, those Wednesday numbers are going to creep to the point where we're going to be, you know, a fully remote situation, I think we would then kind of call a emergency meeting at that point. Any other questions around the DPH matrix? Uh, I just have a quick comment as we close this out. Uh, I think pretty much uh, 
hit all the questions that we all got flooded with in the last 24 hours. So I do appreciate you compiling all those together and instead of us all asking them all around the table. Um, when this all first started and we did the hybrid vote, that was the probably the, the tensest part of my school committee career as a volunteer <laughs> um, with all the full remote, uh, full in person, hybrid. Um, and at first when it all started, I was for all in person. We want to get the kids back, uh, back to uh, class with their friends and learning in a, in a school environment. Um, but, you know, I, I picked the high road and I said, let's do what's best for the kids and the safest. Let's go with the hybrid. And as a parent of four kids in the district, this was, you know, for all the parents that are out there listening, I'm your biggest advocate to go to full in person as quick as possible, but as safe as possible. So I'll be right there as soon as we get the green light from the BPH, the governor, Desi, I'm there with you. Let's get the kids back to full in person. Until that happens, though, one of the comments I made when we took the vote that night is this is a partnership that we have to have between the schools and parents. The school can do everything that they can, the district, at their level to space apart, uh, ride the bus in social distance, and do everything that they can, but we only have those kids for six hours out of the day. The rest of the time, they're at home, they're after school, they're doing baseball, soccer, and I got kids that do sports. But we have to, as parents, be part of that partnership and buy in to hopefully we don't have to go to full remote or turn to the red. So it's a two-way street. Uh, we can't just assume everything's gonna be done at the school level and the district level, and that's gonna fix everything. Um, it's a two-way street that has to be done at home also outside of those six hours of school. So I just recommend the parents, guardians, um, let's work together with the district. Let's do the right thing. Let's keep the kids going in the right direction. And that direction is getting them to pull in person as soon as possible. Sure. Anything else from the committee on this? Great. Mr. Tannis, Mr. Badger, thank you both very much. Um, I appreciate you joining us at this late hour. Um, we may invite you again. <laughs> Welcome. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, folks. Yeah, have a good night. Next up, we have business office and budget report from Ms. Mosquito. Oh, the video. That's right. Thank you, Ms. Mosquito. Um, did that video download, Mr. Sean? We still love it. <laughs> I think we got our internet upgraded. <laughs> there we go. I forgot that. All right, so there's an example board. Let me share it. Yes, okay. <sighs> you guys have a good time, my marker. They're good shots. Mr. Uh, Texera, do you know who could have possibly blew my marker shot? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. I am taller than you. Leave me alone. Hey guys, so I just saw Mr. Shrek and she wants us to figure out a way to um, teach the kids the new uh, protocols for COVID and how to stay safe and healthy in school. So we need to work together to try to figure out something to do for that. All right guys, so we've got a surprise for COVID
team for that but those are the ways that we kind of in a soft and welcoming way trying to disseminate this important information to our kiddos so i thought that was a great example of that when we were walking the building and saw that so thank you to those folks thank you all right um miss macedo now you're up i apologize okay i believe i've unmuted um Good evening, Mr. Dolan, Mr. Swenson, and members of the school committee. Um, this evening, you have in front of you the first uh, quarter uh, quarterly report for fiscal year 21. We've gone from having a 112th budget back in July to having our full budget and um, starting to get all of our staff in place. Um, as we look through the budget, uh, you're going to see areas where we have now inserted some new uh, line account numbers uh, to address COVID so that we can quickly pull out some information. Uh, we do have some areas that are showing deficits because of COVID. We haven't been able to separate them as of just yet. Um, for instance, on page two at the top, we have some IT supplies, Chromebooks and hardware software that was purchased. Uh, I believe a portion of that is uh, COVID related. And so as we pull those things out, you'll be seeing more line accounts um, that will indicate this is a COVID type purchase, which again, uh, we will probably be reclassing any payments to either grant funds, um, uh, whether it be some of the funds that um, Mr. Swint, um, Mr. Uh, Powers has received or funds that we've received from Bridgewater or funds that may be coming in the future as well. Overall, um, we're doing uh, fairly well. Uh, we have about 15% of our budget spent to date and that is from uh, July through the September uh, warrant. So we've got a full three uh, months worth, a full quarter. Um, we have utilized some of our circuit breaker payments, uh, circuit breaker funds. So we've reclassified some of our out of district placements, which are on the, the last page on page 12. Uh, encumbered so far to date, we have about 63% of the bu budget encumbered. Uh, we probably still need to do some more encumbering in the areas of special education uh, out of district tuition. Uh, transportation, we have not made any encumbrances as of yet, um, and things such as uh, health insurance or substitutes, we don't normally encumber anyway. And so there's a balance uh, currently of about 17 million, um, which again is around 23%. And as I said, you know, once we've done transportation, um, and we start spending a little more in the areas we can encumber, uh, we'll be seeing that number going down. Overall, most of uh, what we see are expenditures 
uh, for supplies, PPE supplies, uh, things that are related to getting up and ready for remote learning. Uh, most of the accounts are in good standing. Uh, the majority of them are. There are just a few here or there that, um, you know, are either, as I said, COVID related and need to be teased out. The only other account that um, may appear to be in the negative is on page nine, electricity. We're just estimating at this point. Um, last year, I believe uh, we didn't come in quite as high as our estimates were. So um, again, that's just an estimate there. As I said, we have used some of our circuit breaker funds. Uh, so I believe we have about a million and a half left. So any deficits in the out of district lines, we still have funding to cover those deficits at this point. Um, because we uh, want to be fiscally conservative, every year we um, freeze the budget and tomorrow is the magic day. Um, it's the magic day for Ms. Cohan as well with her October one enrollment, but it's also the magic day for the budget to freeze, which means um, not having expenditures coming out of the budget unless it is something that is uh, needed, um, an emergency or something that crops up that we absolutely have to have. As I said, we have about 63% of the budget already encumbered. So a good part of it is encumbered and spent. Um, if there's anything else that needed to be purchased, it needed to be encumbered um, before the October 1st deadline. And again, if there should be any issues that come up, uh, the process for principals and administrators is to first discuss it with the superintendent. And once the superintendent has authorized it, put the purchase into the um, Infinite Visions requisition process, and um, then I can approve it and move forward with it. Any questions about the budget? You missed one step though, Kat. I build up my courage to come talk to you about <laughs> <laughs> the expenditure. Have said no sometimes, huh? <laughs> But not often. <laughs> Any questions? No? All right, I'll move on. If you do, just uh, pop in with whatever question you may have. And the last item I have is an auditor's contract. Uh, we are uh, looking to uh, have a three-year contract with Powers and Sullivan. Um, they are a, a large firm with over 30 uh, employees. And uh, unfortunately, our current auditor that we had um, has been experiencing uh, issues due to COVID and has had to cut back on some of um, their work. So uh, we have gone through the vetting process with Powers and Sullivan. They work very closely with the state, with MASBO, uh, the Mass. Association of School Business Officials. Uh, they really understand school districts and are ready to start immediately for our FY20 uh, audit. Um, so before you, I have a proposal from them, contract where they will be for the first year uh, matching what we um, were paying our former uh, auditor, uh, 26,000 for the audit. Uh, year two would be 27,000 as well as year three. There's an additional 5,000 per year for the end of year report. And this is something the state requires um, us to have done as well as an additional um, 2,000 to assist with the certification of E and D. Uh, so far to date um, with the help of our new treasurer Natasha Robichaud, we have been able to submit some of the documents toward e and certification. I'm very proud to say that. And um, hopefully we'll be able to um, assist them uh, and, and able to do most of the e and ourselves. So possibly we might not even have the $2,000 charge. Um, so if I could get an approval to move forward with this um, 
contract for three years with Powers and Sullivan for audit work. I appreciate that. <laughs> So, Ms. Macedo, if I did that math very quickly, uh, correctly, it's about $29,600. Um, it's the 26 this year with the 5,000, so that gets us up to 31. And then with 2,000, if we do have them do the E&D work, we'll be up to 33 this year. Okay. okay. So, I will entertain a motion to approve the three-year contract with Powers and Sullivan for the first year of uh, charge of $2,600 uh, $2, for years two and three, $2,700. $2,600. Oh, $2,600. That's what I yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so I'll entertain a motion. I apologize, folks. I'll entertain a motion to um, enter a three-year contract with Powers and Sullivan uh, for $26,000 for the first year, $27,000 for year two and three, on top of uh, a $5,000 uh, charge per year for state reporting and a $2,000 charge per year to uh, cover our E&D certification. Motion by Mrs. King. Second. Second by Mr. Marrera. Any discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Mr. Florence? Aye. Mr. Gelby? Aye. Mr. Hammond? Mr. Hammond, you might be on mute. Maybe. He's under Riley, I believe. Yep. We'll come back to Mr. Hammond. Mrs. Holbrook? Aye. Mrs. King? Aye. Mr. Murrow? Aye. Dr. Freewindowski? Aye. Mr. Hammond? Going once, going twice. Aye. Thank you, sir. Sorry, they won't let me unmute. <laughs> and the chair will decide we have a contract for a new auditor. Thank you, Ms. Macedo. Thank you. Is there anything else? I believe that's it. Okay. Uh, we have a facilities update by uh, Mr. Pacheco. Okay, here I am. <laughs> uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Dolan, school committee. Um, I would uh, I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank the, uh, the BR facility staff, um, custodians, maintenance trades, groundskeeper, and our secretary, Diane Young, for their trust and willingness to work together in order to meet the challenging task of reopening. Uh, we've been back for a while and uh, working very diligently since this all uh, went down and um, I'm very proud of the team. Um, just some uh, brief points here. The uh, cleaning procedures uh, have been fully implemented in all schools um, as indicated in the district-wide COVID-19 cleaning plan. Uh, custodians and sub-custodians are fully aware of the expectations detailed in the plan, along with the daily disinfecting log sign-off. Uh, we have uh, filled the three custodian approved uh, positions by the school committee, um, and they have been assigned to locations and will be trained accordingly with all best practices. Um, all district schools are in compliance with DESE guidance for reopening. Local fire and building officials have issued permits of occupancy for all BR schools. Uh, maintenance trades teams continue to respond to work order requests that are submitted by district staff and teachers, giving each person an active voice in their work areas. Requesters are updated on work status and eventual um, completion throughout the whole process for their information. Um, hand sanitizer and disinfectant uh, wipe st uh, stock with the support of, uh, from the business office, I continue to procure hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes for the district, supplies have been distributed to each classroom and office in some key um, common areas for immediate use. Head custodians continue to update me on storage stock each week, so we may be pre uh, proactive in ordering, hedging against long lead times and maintaining adequate stock in all district schools. Um, 
And once again, I just wanted to uh, make the note that uh, really proud of the staff for working together um, very well. And um, you know, it's been just over a year that I've been on on board, and um, I believe we're doing a pretty good job out there for uh, for the uh, community. So that concludes my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. No, Mr. Pacheco's crew has been doing fabulous in terms of the sanitation at night. I know we were over at the high school the other night uh, for negotiations. We saw that you were in the sprayers, sprayed out on the cafeteria tables, touching all common areas. So um, they're doing a fabulous job. Thank you for the direction of you, Mr. Pacheco, for all your hard work and the hard work of everyone from the facilities department, keeping our kids and our staff healthy and safe each and every day. We appreciate you and them. You're very welcome. And I, I thank the uh, school committee for the support uh, that they've given us to this point. And um, thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Pacheco from the committee? Thank you, Mr. Pacheco, appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Schantz, you are up with a technology report. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the school committee, Superintendent Swenson. The, the IT department has been very busy since the opening of school. Since school started, we've completed 450 work order requests. This number does not include the many password resets, questions in the hallways, or email correspondence. We've also set up, configured, and distributed over 400 teacher laptops before school started. I want to thank our IT techs, technicians, Tom O'Kagey and Chris Kuhn for their uh, hard work this last month. On September 9th, 10th, and 11th, the IT department distributed a total of 961 Chromebooks to families that expressed interest in a previous survey Mr. Swenson sent out um, before school started, stating that they needed a device for remote learning. Out of the 961 Chromebooks, the following percentages are breakdown of who received the of who received the devices by school. George Mitchell Elementary, 29%. Merrill Elementary, 6%. La Liberty, 11%. Bridgewater Middle School, 10%. RMS, 14%. Williams, 13%, and um, the high school, 17%. Since school started, we've been keeping a waiting list of parents who have requested a Chromebook for their child. Since um, we did not have any more inventory, we did have an order placed for some. Those, that order of 500 Chromebooks um, arrived last week. We've been very busy preparing them for distribution. Um, of those 500 Chromebooks, um, those will accommodate everyone on our waiting list. We have scheduled a Chromebook distri distribution at the high school tomorrow night between 5 and 8 p.m. Remaining Chromebooks will be distributed to each school for future requests and device swap outs if motor devices are in need of repair. We've been handling remote support by asking parents to fill out a form on the district's website under the technology department page. Um, this concludes my report for this evening. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Yeah, I can't say the Yeoman's work that this guy's done with, with his team of three, right? And all the Chromebooks that we've gotten into hands of kids, just being on the listservs of superintendents around the Commonwealth and just some area superintendents and just having the issues that they're having, just getting students' devices. Michael came up with a really efficient way of you know, getting it in the hands of students beforehand. People that came to us kind of after the survey that needed devices, we knew that we kind of did a um, combined um, purchase with other uh, communities throughout the Commonwealth from the Department of Elementary and Ed that we had those devices coming in so we knew that we could um, you know put another wait list together 
uh, for those individuals. So I'm happy to say that every student that is in need of one to this point, as of tomorrow evening, will have a device. Um, so thank you, Michael, for what you've done. Thank you to Tom and Tom, uh, Tom and Chris for what they have done. Uh, again, a, a team of three, uh, you know, taking apart all of our Chromebooks, distributing them, um, you know, and then still doing the break fix during hybrid learning and everything else that we need to do. So, Ace, man, great job. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Johnson. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Johnson? Okay, let's see that. Thank you all. Thank you again, Mr. Trump. Um, we covered the personnel report, and now we're going to go to the school committee web page. Ms. Cohen. Hi. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Um, Mr. Dolan, members of the school committee, and uh, Superintendent Swenson, it's my pleasure to be here with you tonight. And I am just waiting to be able to um, share my screen. You make, yeah. Meg, I have the PowerPoint. Do you want me to share the PowerPoint? Um, that, that would work too. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Okay, great. Well, um, as I said, it's a pleasure to be here with you to preview our new, um, new design for our website. You can hop to the next slide. We kind of got received feedback from the BR community that there was three things that stuck out with our current design. There was a lot of clicking. Um, and so we're redesigning to solve some of the these three main issues. One, to reduce the, the clicks to find information, incorporate our social media sites. We have a new uh, YouTube channel. We have a Facebook page. The high school has a Twitter account. And we also wanted to have a, um, to provide a way where the schools and from the district were easily distinguishable. So um, that leads us to the next slide. So as you see here, here is the preview of the high school. And if you click Michael under middle school, you'll see um, the middle school view. So this will be the view for Williams and um, Williams, BMS, and RMS. And then you also see the view for the elementary. So when a, a visitor comes to one of our pages, they'll really see um, the difference. They'll know they're on a different page. These are drafts and uh, the design team is working to finish them. We can move on to our next. Here we are, da, 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 I should have done a drum roll, but this is our new view of our district page. Um, on this page, the, a lot of clicking was when you would click on one of these menus, it would drop down and there'd be a lot more clicking to do. So I wanna preview one of these pages for you and that's your school committee page. So if we just click either right there, that's a good spot we'll go right to our website because this, this is up right now um, for you to visit. Um, maybe that, uh, maybe it's, you might want to just jump to the website. Maybe it went behind it, Michael. Oh, we can share. Uh, yep, you're still sharing the PowerPoint. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You think all this, oh, there we go. <laughs> you think after all these months in quarantine would know this, these Zoom techniques. Um, so here is your um, school committee webpage. You'll see, unlike with the drop down menu, um, where they had to click all the 
to go to submenus, it's all on one page. They see the members of the school committee and a visitor will also see those most important links, the postings, um, the policy manual, any meeting documents, your meeting schedule is right there. Um, and also your nice pictures. So I, I feel like um, right now this page is available. Um, so um, anybody in the BR school community can come here and find information uh, regarding uh, meeting agenda and important documents. So I think um, going this route and making things more visible um, will be more beneficial for uh, uh, our school community. And um, that's the presentation of our school committee page. Thank you, Meg. Any questions for Mike? I was actually uh, on this today uh, to get some information and I saw that the page had changed and this was definitely more user-friendly to find stuff. I, I wanna thank Meg and Ms. McDougal for the work they've done on our website, uh, specifically that page. Um, they have done a lot of work to sort of uh, tighten it up a bit and make it more user friendly for uh, members of the community. One thing I will say is on our page, there is a link down at the bottom left for folks to um, subscribe to meeting notifications. Uh, if folks want to um, get an email about when our meetings are, you can click there and subscribe to it. and it automatically uh, sends them an email. And Ms. McDougal set that up. So uh, that, that's, that's fantastic. That's a huge help for people um, who wanna join our meetings, uh, both these full committee meetings as well as our, our subcommittees. So that is there as an option as well. So thank you both again, Ms. McDougal, thank you. Um, Meg, thank you for your work on that. Thank you very much. Thanks for the support. Right. Um, moving on to new business, we have approval of payroll warrants. I will excuse myself as my wife works for the district. Uh, Ms. King, you have chair. Thank you. Um, I would like to call for a motion to approve the payroll warrants dated September 10th, 2020, and September 24th, 2020. I'm sorry, September 24th, 2020. So moved. Second. Thank you. The motion has been made by Ms. Uh, Mr. Marrera and seconded by Mrs. Holbrook. I will take a roll call vote. Mr. Florence? Aye. Mr. Gelfi? Aye. Mr. Hammond? Mrs. Holbrook? Aye. Mr. Marrera? Aye. Dr. Prewindowski? Aye. Mr. Hammond? Aye. Thank you. And the motion passes. And I will return the Meeting to Mr. Dolan. Thank you, Ms. King. Moving on, we'll approve, uh, entertain a motion to approve the general ledger warrants dated September 10th and September 24th. So moved. By Mr. Marrera, second. Second by Ms. King. Roll call vote. Mr. Florence. Aye. Mr. Gelfi. Aye. Mr. Hammond. Aye. Mrs. Holbrook. Aye. Mrs. King. Aye. Mr. Moran? Aye. Dr. Primadowski? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, on our agenda tonight, uh, we have two uh, COVID 19 nursing staff additions, Mr. Uh, Mr. Swanson. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Dole. So, basically, what we've talked about tonight with <clears throat> all of the work we've been doing with the local health agents, we're realizing that when we're doing a lot of this contact tracing, it is a lot of work. For our teach for our uh, nurses, who actually still have to perform their regular duties of med distribution, triage of any type of um, you know injuries or medical situations that may come their way. So basically, what we have um, thought about doing, and this work we're working with our nurse leader Claire Grennan, is to um, post two positions that would allow these individuals that would not be necessarily attached to any individual school, but more at the district level. And anytime we have a situation at a school where we need to do some type of contact tracing, 
which involves then reaching out to parents um, to, of students who are then considered to be close contacts uh, for quarantine reasons. Uh, we really feel as though we need these individuals um, as part of our staff uh, for this year. You will also be able to, if we're able to hire uh, people in this position as nurses, sub any time where we might need them in different areas of the um, district and also help us with some of our Medicaid um, fi uh, uh, filing as well. So these two individuals, one will be paid out of a, uh, the CARES Act monies that are coming to us for Bridgewater, which would then make that position budget neutral. The second one would come out of uh, the operational budget. There is some monies within the nursing line that's currently there that we'll be able to utilize um, for the funding of this position. We have vetted this through Kathy Macedo, and she um, is agreeable to it in terms of the funding for it. So um, we would like to move forward with uh, these two positions. I think it would help. I'm just really concerned about the burnout factor for, for our nursing staff based upon what the last two weeks have been in terms of contact tracing and, and contacting close to 75 to 80 parents, you know, on top of all the other duties that they're responsible for. So. Any questions for Mr. Swenson on the two COVID-19 years? I have one question, Mr. Swenson. Is this, uh, are these two hires on a temporary basis? Or one year appointment. One year appointment. Yeah. Any other questions? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to approve the addition of two COVID-19 nurses to the nursing staff. So moved. Motion by Mr. Marrera. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Florence. Roll call vote, Mr. Florence. Aye. Mr. Gelpie? Aye. Mr. Hammond? You're on mute, sorry. Oh. Aye. Ms. Solberg? Aye. Mrs. King? Aye. Mr. Marrera? Aye. Dr. Freemondowski? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. We are now at the point of the meeting for public comment. The school committee welcomes information, concerns, and opinions from those attending the meeting um, in order to give those wishing to comment a fair opportunity to speak, ensure compliance with open meeting law and other legal obligations, and avoiding the disruption of the meeting. The committee will not engage with the speaker and uh, or with one another in deliberation of uh, comments made. If at the discretion of the committee, we may schedule uh, issues raised by the speaker for deliberation at further meetings. We ask everyone to please give your name um, and the town you live in, uh, and please keep your comments to three to four minutes. I see someone with a hand raised. Lori Moses. Lori Moses, you have your hand raised. Oh, sorry. Yes, I do. Good evening. How are you tonight? Very good. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to just say a couple words. Right now, we are a full remote. Um, we're in a full remote learning situation. We have Mrs. Danielson, and she is outstanding. She is a great teacher. Um, my questions kind of lie with the number of students she has assigned to her. Um, right now, I know when we first started, there was about 41 students. I think it's dropped down now to either 40 or 39. Um, my concerns lie with that class size. Um, what I'm wondering is, I know that you spoke a little bit about hiring additional remote teachers. So one of my questions um, is, what is your ideal remote class size? Um, and with that class size, I'm wondering, what is the number of teachers assigned to that? Like, should they share a subject or um, share the class itself? Um, I'm, I'm concerned because when I look at some of the numbers, I know when you were showing different class sizes and you were showing cohort, cohorts, that you were showing much lower numbers. So almost like half of what our classes are. So I almost feel as if being a remote family and having a student that's learning remotely, that I'm almost being penalized because the teacher is being um, given twice the number of students as a class that's a cohort. 
And if I could do that, I would, but our in particular situation is that I can't. So that's definitely a concern that I have. So I'm hoping that that can be addressed. Um, and the second thing that I would just like to say real quickly is when we look at students that have gone through, you know, traumatic events, um, usually there is some type of counseling or some type of support given to them. These kids that are entering the school now, we have kids that are going into different cohorts that none of their friends um, that they were previously in school with are now present with them. I'm concerned about their mental health. Um, I'm wondering, is there going to be any type of support given to them in terms of counseling or anything along that line? So those are my concerns. Um, I thank you for your time tonight and for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Bowen. I would encourage you to reach out to Mr. Swenson tomorrow, specifically about that first topic. Um, I know that there are things that he can, he can work through with you. Have anyone else? Oh, we've got two more minutes. Heather, Heather Welsh. Ms. Welsh. Yes, um, my name is Heather Welch. I live in Bridgewater. Um, and my statement is this. Mr. Swenson caused widespread panic, finger pointing, and a tremendous amount of parent blame last night by penning an email that began the purpose of this email message is to inform you that over the course of the last 14 days, 15 Bridgewater Raynham Regional School District students have tested positive for COVID-19. However, tonight, health agents of both towns then reported that these numbers are much, much lower. Two students in Bridgewater and five in Raynham. Where is the school district getting these numbers? Why is there such a large discrepancy between the superintendent's email and the proceedings tonight? Where was the number of 15 BRRSD students having tested positive retrieved from? I realize that this comment will go unanswered, but this discrepancy needs to be explained immediately by district admin. It must also be incredibly clear going forward that the school district shares data and communications that matches the health department data. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Kelsey. Levy? Um, hi, my name's Kelsey Levy. I'm actually a student at Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School who is doing the Ingenuity program. And I just wanted to thank you for your transparency on what you are being reported on, what's going on with Ingenuity. But I feel like it's only right for a student <laughs> to be transparent about what is actually going on versus what's being reported. So. Um, I just wanted to say like, this is not placing blame on anyone, but where do I begin? So <laughs> the teachers that we have been assigned to, to report to are one, a librarian, an English teacher and a social studies teacher. We have never met them before. You know, it's, we don't know them. Um, also, I was struggling in a class that does not include English or social studies and many of my peers were struggling. So I decided to reach out to another teacher to ask a question and I was quickly told not to do that, to stay within the teachers assigned to me. But my question is, if I have a question in an advanced placement class like biology or, you know, like a math class, who can I go to? I just feel like there has been a lack of communication. And, you know, I've been told, go to the tutor on ingenuity. I, I know that that's, a, that's an option. And I've gone to the tutor and the tutor is not available for all classes. The tutor is not available for Spanish, for any electives, for, you know, any AP courses. And when you do go to the tutor, most of the time, it tells you to go and talk to your teacher with questions. So my comment is like, 
I just feel um, the students of ingenuity are kind of being put on the back burner because we're kind of lost, you know, stranded in left field here. Like <laughs> we, like I, I am a straight A student and all of a sudden, you know, my grades are slipping before me and there's nothing I can do about it. And it's just, we've tried reaching out to people in administration, no answer or, you know, answers that are like, oh, well, ask the librarian with like technical questions, but we don't have technical questions. We have academic questions that are not being answered. And that's not the teacher's fault because, you know, they're not, they're not AP teachers. They're not math teachers. They're not science teachers. They're not Spanish teachers. And they're grading my science, Spanish, math, and AP work when they are not, you know, that's not their jurisdiction. So I don't know. I just wanted to put that out there, you know, make it clear to you, like what's actually happening. It's, it's not working the program. And it, before this is filed off as like a personal issue between me, I have reached out to either like my friends who were doing ingenuity or other students who are in my grade, I'm a junior, who um, are doing ingenuity and they all are having the same issues. So that is my comment. I just wanna thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. I would encourage you to reach out to Mr. Swenson tomorrow um, and um, have a conversation with him specifically. Um, I can't see that far. Michelle Hoffman. Um, hi, my name is Michelle Hoffman, and I have student a uh, uh, tenth grade student at BR High and an eighth grade student at the Bridgewater Middle School. Um, my children are both full remote, and my tenth grader um, has been a longtime participant in band. Um, the band instructors in the music department has done an amazing job to try and include the children that are full remote to allow them to access um, band and chorus during the school day and have worked with the ingenuity proctors in order to facilitate this um, to be able to happen. But unfortunately, we've been told that um, our children won't receive any credit for the almost one hour a day that they spend in their band class because Grading in ingenuity and grading in PowerSchool through Google Classroom are two separate systems, and they can't get credit for the work they're they're doing in band. Um, everybody that has their children in the BR at home remote system is doing it for a variety of reasons. Ours are due to family medical concerns, and. Um, as it's been stated by previous people, there is this feeling of punishment that um, my children are doing online learning at home and that they are not given the same resources that would be available to them if they were in the hybrid model. Um, I think that the music department has done an amazing job of making these things accessible and I think it's a small thing to try and give these kids credit for something that is a passion of theirs and something that they work really hard for. And I think I have already reached out to the superintendent's office on numerous occasions. And so that's why I'm presenting my concerns to the school committee. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Anyone else? Anyone else here to make public comment? Public comment going once, going twice. Okay, we'll be closing public comment. Thank you, folks. Um, Thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, does anyone on the committee have anything to, um, any announcements? Okay. Uh, I just wanna say as we wrap up the second full week of school on behalf of the entire school committee um, and the communities we collectively serve, I wanna thank every employee of the district. Um, they have worked tirelessly 
and we realize that the start of this year has been like no other. Um, but each of you have stepped up with grace and collectively maneuvered your way through the situation. Um, we recognize there have been some bumps in the road, as Mr. Swenson said, and there are every year. And we will work through those long, to those bumps in the road as a team. Um, the school committee has uh, seen firsthand and has been told of the collaboration in, that is happening in all of the schools, and we are grateful for it. Um, as Derek and Ryan have said, uh, there is no playbook for what we're doing right now, um, and we can only come together and raise each other up and support our children in our collective care. So again, thank you to every employee of this district. I want to thank my fellow school committee members who have um, attended meeting after meeting, many hours spent getting us ready to reopen. So everyone deserves a collective thank you. So with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Mr. Marrera, motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Go on stay. Uh, second by Mr. Florence. Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Florence. Aye. Mr. Gelby. Aye. Mr. Hammond. Oh, we made uh, Mrs. Holbrook. Aye. Mrs. King. Aye. Mr. Marrera. Aye. Dr. Prewandowski. Aye. Mr. Hammond, one more time. Aye. There you go. Thank you, sir. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much again for attending. Have a great night.